Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have a guitarist with me today, and it's been a while since I've had a guitarist. Sharon Nisbin is with me. Welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to meet you this way. <laughs> so, Virtually. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's really uh, a crazy time that we're living now. And uh, I was going to ask right away, uh, how are you dealing with the current situation? What are you doing? And uh, you're an active performer. You're an active teacher. How are you communicating with your students and your audiences? Well, my students, I finished up the Juilliard semester by teaching virtually, uh -huh. and I had them send me audio files of their pieces with PDFs of the music, and mm -hmm. I would act as their personal recording producer and give them a critique, just itemized every single line, every measure, anything that needed legato, that needed better fingering, that needed shaping, that mm -hmm. needed different dynamics, different phrasing. And in a way, it was an actually spectacularly successful way of doing it, rather than my other colleagues did. It forced them to really listen carefully before they made their audio recording, and mm. they probably had to do it several times to succeed. Yeah. And then everything that I wrote was indelible. It was there. They could never escape it. And yeah. it was something that will be there forever for them to reference. Mm -hmm. So I think it worked out really, really well. And they, they were happy, and their progress was extraordinary. Mm. So there are benefits to being in person and there are benefits to doing it this way as well. And yeah. they live in Australia. And of course, everybody was sent home um, come uh, March at, mm -hmm. at spring break. So nobody came back after spring break and it just evolved in a very natural oh. way. Otherwise, I'm actually busier than ever yeah. because even though concerts have been canceled, I, I have just navigated the release of two brand new albums on the same day, May 22. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty unusual itself. I'm the executive producer of both of them wow. with a marvelous label, Zoho, which has an affinity both for jazz and for classical and world music. And that turned out to be very fortuitous because the first album, Strings for Peace, is world music. It's world premiere ragas for guitar and sarad that were composed for me by Amjad Ali Khan. And the second album, Affinity, and we'll talk more about these, is a multicultural album that features everything from a brand new concerto by Chris Brubeck that was written for me, in addition to other works by composers who have uh, written the, the music for me, Leo Brower from Cuba, which is African-influenced, Richard Daniel Poor, Persian-influenced, with the guest uh, Isabel Leonard, and there's Leo Brower, uh, uh, the El de Camaro Negro is, is his work. Then a, a work by uh, Antonio Lauro from Venezuela in a new setting for two guitars. And as well, Tan Dun from China, who is bringing together two cultures, Spanish guitar and the ancient Chinese lute or pipa. Wow, that's amazing. And, and one thing that, um, you know, looking at your career is amazing is that you're always active and trying to promote and um, premiere new works. Why are new works important and why are you so passionate about it? It, it, it could seem, seem a little bit scary. Well, for me, it's really just about being stimulated by extraordinary artists that I've had the honor and pleasure of working with. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Strings for Peace, that is an album that really began its its journey more than 10 years ago when I was contacted by a legend from India. He is from six generations of the Sarod, which is an instrument that is plucked, but it's a metal instrument and they use a plectrum and they have no frets. So it's quite different from the guitar, but put together, it creates a very unique kind of fusion. Anyway, he contacted me, he wanted to meet, he wanted me to hear his music and he wanted to explore the idea of a collaboration. And it took time for this to evolve. During that time, we had a friendship and the friendship extended to his two brilliant sons. Amjad Ali Khan's sons are Ayan Ali Bangash and Aman Ali Bangash. Mm -hmm. And over these 10 years, we would hear each other perform. And eventually they found the ideal collaborative partner to notate the music that Amjad wanted to compose for us. And who also had some skills as an arranger and a jazz player and, and a guitar. So he was able, Kyle Paul, to put all this down in notation. And suddenly one day I received an email, this would have been December of 2018, mm -hmm. saying, check your inbox. We've just sent you some ragas. And I said, really, okay. 
and they were gorgeous. And I answered back, these are really beautiful. And Ayan said, well, that's good because we've already booked a tour for you to do with us in India in February. And I said, well, that's, that's in like two and a half months. He said, yes, but that's, that's when we were able to grab the halls, Mumbai, Calcutta, and Delhi. And I said, you can't make it later. And they said, no, it, it, we need to do it now. And I had to kind of change my schedule around. I was tied up all of January recording an album with the Pacifica String Quartet, uh, which came out last year called Souvenirs of Spain and Italy. And that really required an enormous amount of focus because it was challenging music. And just, I mean, they're one of the great quartets on the planet. And I wanted to bring my, my A game to that. We'd been performing together already for four years. So somehow we managed to get this Indian raga thing going. And I arrived a few days early to India to rehearse with them. And it was just an extraordinary experience. That's amazing. And uh, one thing that's always fascinating about people who premiere a lot of works is the collaboration with uh, composers. And I know you've done so many, but is, is, are there composers that you really had a close collaboration with where, you know, they really made you test out certain things that you, you want, you want, uh, they want to achieve on your instrument and otherwise, I know I've, I've, I've uh, heard other interviews and I know you've talked about this, but for my audiences, if you can please share some of those memories. That, that's really a great question. And I'll just briefly say in the context of the Indian ragas mm -hmm. that it collaborating with an instrument that has no frets meant that I had to adopt certain ideas of slides and bent notes and different kinds of filigree in order to match their improvisational, mm -hmm. especially approach in the slow sections and in the fast sections, because I'm not using a pick, I would just use the thumb and index finger very, very quickly to be able to adapt to their speed. And sometimes I would, I would do these two fingers as well. It was really a whole process of wow. exploration that had to be condensed into a very short time to do it. But just to mention that I had a revelation our first night on the stage, I was playing one of the Spanish pieces I've played thousands of times, Asturias by Albanese, and suddenly I heard it with completely new ears. It was, oh my God, I, I suddenly get this whole concept of the Indian gypsies migrating across many lands and landing in Spain and becoming part of the evolution of flamenco, mm. which then certainly influenced many Spanish composers like Turina, Granado, Salvenis. Mm. And that brought me home. I'm playing Asturias in a beautiful Cante Hondo flamenco section. And I felt that whole Indian raga influence that I had been steeped in for the last several days. And it was really like an epiphany in a way. And it made the sense of oneness and unity very, very powerful. In terms of your questions about composers kind of stretching the limit, I, I certainly remember a time with Lucas Foss when he was writing a concerto for me. I had asked him to do it inspired by American folk music. And one of the things he was curious about was could I hook up to some sort of electronic gear to have a delay system? So I explored that and it seemed like it was probably gonna be a can of worms. So I said, maybe there's another way we could do that. And he said, well, yeah, how about if you tap on the instrument in different positions to create different kinds of pitches while you're playing? He said, well, no one's asked me to do that before, but I'll give it a whirl. So he gave me a melody and asked me to figure out how to make that happen by tapping in different spots on the instrument while I was playing. And it, it really made, uh, you know, standing up and down and rubbing your stomach and whatever those things you're supposed to do at, at once seem like child's play. And this was really complex and I, and I loved the challenge of it and I made it work. So I didn't have to do the electronic stuff. I was able to create the delay effect myself by doing this unusual technique. John Coriano, uh, mm -hmm. when he wrote the concerto for me, he decided it would be a really cool idea. And partly of that is my fault. I, I suggested that I could somehow perambulate in the orchestra and walk while I played the guitar because I was gonna be the French troubadour. And I had mm -hmm. suggested the idea of celebrating the 13th century magic and romantic beauty of the French troubadours. Mm -hmm. And he loved that idea. So he thought, I'll start backstage, be the ghostly evocation through the years of, of time that would come uh, sort of filtering through. And then 
he gave me the fastest, longest run I'd ever seen in my life. And I was supposed to play that wow. while walking. Wow. So I had to rig up a whole system with suction cups on the guitar because I wasn't willing to drill a hole. And somehow to create the, uh, the ability to walk and play this fast run that went on for a few minutes at the same time before I sat down. And I had to pace back and forth in my living room doing this for a few weeks to get the hang of it. Yeah. And finally I did, but you know, these are the challenges that make something new happen. And when yeah. you're working, especially with composers who don't play the instrument, mm -hmm. they aren't in any way limited by preconceptions. Yeah. The whole world is open to them. So it's up to the, the performer to find a way to meet their, their imagination mm -hmm. and make it work. Yeah. Well, you've been, uh, legendary as far as you know performing and premiering works and just playing all over the world but also you're equally important as an educator because you've started the program at the Juilliard school you've also started the program at the Aspen school and it's always great to get the the, the person's perspective who's uh, has the passion and uh, mind to start something that's never been done before what what, what kind of uh, forced you to do that or what what inspired you to even start a program at one of the great schools in the world well i was honored to be asked and mm -hmm. certainly yeah. that was exciting to me because it meant that i could create the department from scratch mm -hmm. and do what i believed in which was to encourage collaborations with my students with other instruments mm -hmm and to encourage them to do contemporary music. It's turned out to be really an ideal place because they have the Focus Festival that Joel Sachs organizes every year. And many of my students have been involved in world premieres there. Mm. And it, whether it's guitar and orchestra or two guitars or guitar and other instruments, they have fantastic opportunities to play at Lincoln Center and create new music. And they, they just lap up the challenge, they love yeah. it. And the other departments were really welcoming because they were thrilled to have guitar and flute and guitar and mm -hmm. violin and string quartet, all of that. So in addition to their solo work, they learn how to be part of a musical community. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question, again, this is for your whole career, but uh, you've collaborated with so many non-classical artists uh, and what, what kind of drives you and, and what inspires you to work with non-classical artists, especially since one of my past guests is one of your collaborators, and that's Mark O'Connor, uh, ah, yes. who, who was on my podcast a, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, maybe some, some of those collaborations, non-classical though, I, I want to hear some of those, uh, what inspired you to, to take those challenges on? Well, in the case of Mark, he actually... I, we met somewhere at a festival and he said, I'd really like to, to work with you. And I had, was already a fan of his playing. Mm -hmm. So I suggested the idea that he do a setting of strings and threads mm -hmm. because I knew and loved that piece for the two of us to do together. It would be a recreation of the piece in a new setting. And he went for it. So that was how we collaborated. And by that point, I was already creating an album that it eventually was called journey to the new world and in that i was premiering a new piece by the late british composer john dwart called the joan baez suite which i'd asked him to write inspired by music that baez had made famous in the early part of her career and and when baez heard it she offered to be on the album as wow. well and sing a couple songs so as mark and i were rehearsing preparing for some concerts i said you know this is perfect this fits in the whole concept the the evolution of of folk music starting in the British Isles, traveling through 16th, 17th century Ireland, Scotland, crossing the ocean with the immigrants and their dreams, mm -hmm. and landing in the United States and becoming what would then be the new world, of course, and later the United States, and becoming part of our folk tradition. I said, can we do strings and threads on this? It would be the perfect journey. So he said, yes. Yeah. So some things just you know, they happen organically. You, you are inspired by something and you have a, a sense that there will be a, a unique way of working together. And with Mark, that was certainly part of the process. Um, but he was actually long in the line of, of others uh, that I had begun. I, I think the whole crossover project that uh, became popular in the States was something that was not popular at all when I began doing it with Larry Coriel and Laurindo Almeida, who really brought Bossa Nova to the West from Brazil. And that was in, in the 80s. So 
I've always been attracted to beautiful music and I didn't see boundaries as to what style or genre it would be. And when Steve Vai and I began working together, he's the rock guru, guru in guitar, it was just a natural thing. And I, I've had a trio with Romero Lubambo and uh, it's, it's also been fantastic. And Stanley Jordan as part of that trio to, to work together with people who play different kinds of instruments, different music, right for us. And uh, I, I just love that pro process because it's, it's constantly a discovery. Well, um, looking, you're constantly working on new projects, but is there a concerto, is there a project that you would love to go back to and do it again or do something new with it? That's a great question. I think that part of the answer to that is that I've been really fortunate to be able to play repeated times some of the, the really amazing works that have been composed for me. So in the case of the John Coriano Troubadours, I've, I've been able to perform that more than 80 times. Wow. And in the case of the Christopher Rouse Concerto, which is Concerto Gaudi, inspired by the architecture of Gaudi, which in a way is like listening to a Dali painting. You have these surrealistic images that draw on Spanish flamenco, but then are turned on their head. And I have played that one as well, that concerto, re after recording it. Uh, have played that over 80 times. Wow. Some others, maybe not quite as much, the Joe Schwantner piece, uh, a number of different times with orchestras. So each time it is like a reinvention. Mm -hmm. And I might go back and listen to the recording and think, that was, that was pretty good then, or I might want to change that now, or the tempos are faster. All of that is part of the process. In the case of the Chris Brubeck Concerto, which is featured on one of the two new albums, Affinity, it's a work that I premiered with the Maryland Symphony in 2015. And Elizabeth Scholes, who conducted the premiere, had already done a number of Chris's pieces. So it was a natural that we would match up to do this. And when it came time to make a recording, I'd already performed it with some seven different orchestras. So it was great to have a real opportunity to live in the music, to get the tempos up to speed, to really appreciate the nuances because he writes in a jazz style and there are wonderful Middle Eastern influences as well and to sort of somehow process all of that within so that it became something very, very natural. So we recorded that with the Maryland Symphony and Elizabeth Schulz conducting in September of 2018. And then the rest of the album, which does not involve orchestra, I did in May of 2019. So it, it really is always good to have the chance to live in something before you make a more definitive statement of it. And it's, it's, uh, it's great that you're able to uh, perform some of these uh, great compositions that are from the 20, 21st century a couple of times, because sometimes you hear a piece and it's done once and it's premiered and then you don't hear it for a while and you don't, you don't see it. But the, the important thing about premieres and new works is that we have to present it to the public a couple of times for, for the audiences to love it as much as we love it. And it's, it's, it's great that you're able to do that. Uh, changing gears a little bit, uh, something for your fans, for your followers who know so much about you, something that they don't know and you're willing to share on the podcast with us. Well, I, I have to apologize to you because I was a little late in starting this. Uh -huh. I, did, I did give you advance warning, but part of that was that I, I go jogging. Uh -huh. And in New York City during the pandemic, uh, suddenly everybody has discovered Riverside Drive. And you know, it used to be that Nah, I had it all to myself pretty much and a few people here and there. But now people are dying to get out. And of course, I don't really want to run into throngs of people. So I have to make sure that I get it done before three o'clock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, that means that I, I couldn't do it after our interview. I had to really get out there and go. And it was, it's, you know, it's very beautiful running along the river. But it's also a, a bit of a, a process because if someone is running towards you, or on their bike and they don't have a mask on, I have to kind of zigzag out of the way because I, I really don't want whatever's in their air trail. So it, it's, it's not the same as it was before, but it is a great opportunity to get exercise and to really be in the beauty of nature. Everything is in bloom now. There's so many flowers. It's just really gorgeous. And I appreciate that. And I'm right near the river. So I, I, I can't be happier to have such an opportunity. But um, 
this this winter, for example, uh, there wasn't enough snow. I usually keep a pair of cross country skis in my closet here in New York City, wow. and take them out and go in Central Park when we have one of those famous snowfalls. But there was none this year. So these these are some of the things that that I do on the sly, and uh, I I love going to the jungles and the Amazon, and really being part of nature and exploring and seeing all kinds of amazing animals in the wild, whether it's in the Galapagos or in the Ecuadorian or Brazilian Amazon. So I've had many opportunities to do this and it really makes me feel somehow connected to a bigger picture. Well, going back a little bit earlier on uh, to your competition career, and I know you've been successful. A lot of young musicians, as you would know, you have students struggle with it and they also have a lot of you know anxiety towards competitions and post competition results. Uh, what advice would you give them specific to competitions? Well, one of the things that I've done for since I was 17 years old is practice transcendental meditation. And transcendental meditation is is an ancient practice that evolved thousands of years ago in India. That was another reason I was fascinated to journey to India. Mm -hmm because this has been such an important part of my life. It's not religious, it's just a relaxation technique. You do it 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon. And that revitalizes me. I feel like I've, I live twice as much life doing this. I have twice as much energy because it is so rejuvenating and it's a great way of dealing with stress, whether it's the stress of a competition or the stress of a concert or of a world premiere. It's amazing the effect that it has. So. Having done a number of benefits for the David Lynch Foundation, which is an extraordinary organization that brings transcendental meditation, they've raised millions of dollars, they bring transcendental med meditation to underserved communities, whether it is soldiers returning from stress with PTSD or women from battered women's shelters or kids, they've now reached over a million children, many of whom come from challenged urban centers teaching the meditation and the results in schools, for example, have been extraordinary. The, the scholastic rates go way up and the violence rates way down and kids are better able to focus and really cope with life and make what is inside of them emerge with a, a real positive energy. So having done benefits with the likes of Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld and Katy Perry and even performing together with Sting on stage at Carnegie Hall, I was really thrilled to have the opportunity when the David Lynch Foundation asked if I would create an inlet into Juilliard so they could offer for free to all the staff, faculty, and students who wanted to partake of this opportunity to learn TM for free. And TM basically is of uh, four one-hour lessons in a lecture, that's it. I mean, it's actually one lesson, one-on-one, -on -one, two group meditations, and that's preceded by two group lectures. So we're talking about a total of four or five hours it, that's it, for life, and you're set. I mean, what is that? That's no sacrifice at all. But my students, I insisted they take this class, and it was miraculous what happened afterwards. One always has to approach anything like this such as TM, without any expectations. And in this case, even I was stunned. They started winning competitions and creating new revolutionary creative ideas that no one in the 130 year history of Juilliard had ever thought of. And, I mean, it, it was just really quite something. And one of my students from China, Tang Wei Zhang, ended up winning the most prestigious competition in the world for classical guitar just a year after learning TM and a number of other competitions as well, making his first album. Uh, another student of mine from Austra Australia, Alberta Curie, decided she would do outreach, not just normal outreach like people are doing, but to the community at Juilliard, the people who paint the walls, who serve the food, who uh, we take for granted every day. And one man, he was on the ladder painting when she invited him to her concert and he broke down in tears and he said, I've been here for 24 years. No one's ever invited me to anything before. So with that, she has created a whole way of reaching out to the community. And it's, it's been extraordinary to see her being welcomed. So she extended that a step further. She figured out a way, she actually drilled a hole in one of her guitars 
to be able to serenade the office staff throughout the building. Wow. And instead of being annoyed, they loved it. For them, it was relaxing. Here you have this beautiful guitar music and to be serenaded personally in your office during a stressful day and having just that moment of respite and that connection to music. No one's ever done that in the 130 year history of Juilliard. So I'm not saying TM did that, but I'm saying, boy, it's pretty likely that that gave them the opportunity to access their own inner creative world with no barriers. Yeah. And that's uh, amazing because uh, sometimes musicians can get stuck and, you know, they want to win that principal bass position, for example, in San Francisco Symphony or right. something. And they, if they don't get to that moment, they're so devastated and they don't want to continue. But, but the, the great thing about those stories is that the students fa find new paths to uh, be helpful through music and also make a career as musicians because it's not always just about one thing because if it was right. about one thing then you, you might not have the career that you have because you've gone on to premiere works by composers from all over the world and done so many different projects with diverse composers from different backgrounds and different genres that's very important um, I want to know um, other than classical music what you listen to is there, are there other music uh, styles that you listen to regularly uh, as a part of your playlist? One of my favorite people to listen to if I just want to relax is Lorena McKinnett from Canada. Have, have you heard her music? No, all? no, no. I'm actually, I'm, I'm about to write it down so I could, I could check it out. Well, it, she, she's really quite extraordinary and uh, sort of 10 times more than Enya. Um, who, who is pleasing and relaxing too, but with a sophistication that is, is amazing and a lot of Celtic influences, but she writes her own music. Her band is just stunning. I've heard them live in concert and uh, really, really, really beautiful. Um, from uh, Cape Verde, Cesaria Evoria. Okay. Uh, she's uh, from Cape Verde. It's a language that is complex to understand because it's kind of a combination of French, Portuguese, and uh, all of that, but and Spanish. But you get the gist of it, and and she's just she is no longer alive. But I had the opportunity to hear her in Carnegie Hall as well. So whether it is Melissa Etheridge or any of these other artists, uh, there's and Pink. I mean, there are so many great people. I mean, I was at the Grammys when Pink did her acrobatic thing and I was in the audience and she was swooped up into the air like Cirque du Soleil. She's amazing at, at doing that. And then there was this downfall of water uh, as she came down. And fortunately I was not in that area, but Steve Vai was. So Steve and I were texting each other throughout this whole thing. I said, Steve, it looks like you just got wet there. <laughs> so it was really pretty funny, but that was something I will never forget. She sang while she was doing these amazing acrobatics th through the ceiling and over the audience of tens of thousands and to sing while doing that, boy, <laughs> well, I, uh, uh, I'll never complain again. <laughs> I must note that uh, I think you might be one of the few classical musicians to have uh, performed at the Grammys as part of the main show, right? Is that correct? It wasn't the main show. It was the show that came before. Okay. And it was still the only classical performance at all throughout the whole uh, 2010, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, Grammy experience. So that was really a lot of fun. And I was working with bluegrass musicians. Uh -huh. And um, I've had a couple of Grammy Award, well, multiple Grammy Award winning artists on my podcast. And, and some of them are super excited that they have had uh, the Grammys and others, they don't care much. What do the Grammy Award, uh, what do your Grammy Awards mean to you? Well, it doesn't change who you are or how you play, but it does give you an entree into the bigger picture of the music world because it's, it's a certain kind of stamp of approval by your peers. And, and that is exciting and it's very valuable. Hmm. Well, um, a big question. I like this for, uh, I, I asked this of all my guests, but uh, a life-changing moment, both a personal life-changing moment and a musical life-changing moment. Well, they probably are the same in this context. I was asked in 2002 to play at the first ever memorial for 9-11, and this was at Ground Zero. And I wondered how I was going to be able to do this because it had been such a traumatic thing to be in New York when all of this happened and to know how just sad and devastating it was. 
But I said yes, because how could I not say yes? And the moment I walked out on stage in front of 40,000 family members and survivors, many of them were holding up signs and images of their lost loved ones. And they were right at the edge of the stage at Ground Zero. It was the first time they had actually been allowed to be on those grounds. This was music that a few of us musicians, it was Yo-Yo Ma, the Juilliard String Quartet, myself, and a couple of other people, we were asked to play during the reading of the names of the nearly 3,000 who were murdered. And this went on for several hours. And it was transformative because I realized, literally in the moment I walked out, I thought, okay, this, this is so, this is why I'm on the planet, to be part of the healing process, to that's what music really can do and why it is so important. So I, I kind of went into an alternative, I would say, universe at that moment. And it wasn't until after that I viewed the actual footage on television some hours later that I fell apart with, with the emotion of it all. But at that moment, I was swept up into the need and the importance of music being part of healing. And I've never forgotten that. And I decided as a result of that experience that for the next year after September 2002, that for every concert I played, whenever I did an encore, I would reference that and I would play one of the pieces that I had performed that day. And you would be astonished after every single concert, there'd be people who would come up to me and say, I'd lost, I had lost a father or a child or a cousin or my best friend or a sibling. And they said, it meant so much to me that you referenced this and that you cared and that that music means a lot to those of us who are listeners. And, and one person uh, in the orchestra that I played in <clears throat> somewhere in the South, she came up to me and she said, my brother was supposed to be at the World Trade Center that day, but he woke up late. He slept through his alarm, so he didn't go, but his best friend died. And she said, when I watched that broadcast, she said, I hoped I would meet one of the musicians to thank them for how much that meant to me. So yes, that's transformative. Wow, that's, that's powerful. Um, uh, now going to uh, a couple more questions for you. Uh, mentors are such a big part of our lives and, and I know you've had some uh, you know, uh, extraordinary, legendary mentors. Uh, maybe a couple of stories, and I won't tell you which, which mentors to pick, but some of the special mentors and maybe some stories of what they meant to you. Well, I was very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to study Baroque performance practice for 10 years with the great Bach scholar and keyboard artist, Rosalind Turek. She's mm -hmm. legendary in the field yeah, yeah. and has performed and recorded nearly everything that Bach wrote for the keyboard. So I went to her when I was still in college mm -hmm. And I, I was a student at Yale University. They had no guitar department. I was actually teaching college seminars for budding guitars at that moment. But there was no one for me to study with. And I knew that I needed help with Baroque performance practice because some of the most beautiful literature for the instrument comes from the lute suites that Bach wrote, the so-called lute suites. And some of them were actually inspired by the Lautenberg or for other keyboard-like uh, instruments that then he arranged for lutes. So I called her up. She happened to have moved back to New York at a time from many years, having spent many years in England. Mm -hmm. And I reached her on the phone and I said, I'd really love to study with you. I'm a guitarist. And she was intrigued by that. And I think one of the reasons she was intrigued is that she knew that the lute played a role in the legacy of the harpsichord and I think was intrigued to study and work with me on, on music that she hadn't yet done. And it, she said, well, let's set up a lesson, see how it goes. So I went in, I was still in New Haven at, at Yale and I took the train in and had a lesson with her and she said, well, I think we can do something together. So we ended up spending the first year on one suite and each time I thought, well, okay, we're ready, ready, ready for the next one. She said, no, we're ready for the next level. <laughs> so that, that was a, you know, a, a great way to start to understand what depth and intensity really meant yeah. and detail and discipline. She really taught me discipline on, on many levels. 
So I ended up working on all the Bach flute suites with her, and I have a recording out that reflects our collaborative editions together. We published a couple of them for Shermer. So I would say she was certainly foremost in, in my influences, and I also had the opportunity to study with Oscar Gilia for five summers at the Aspen Music Festival. And that was really a, a wonderful opportunity since I began my studies in Italy when I was a child, and it, Oscar was actually a colleague and friend of my first teacher in Italy when I was, when I was nine years old. So um, I would say that if that hadn't happened, I probably would never have learned about Aspen or come to appreciate its great value. And now I've been directing the guitar department there since 1993. That's amazing. Um... Since you talked about all the composers, I have to ask, is there a composer that hasn't composed for a guitar, you know, maybe the Beethoven, the Mozart, that you wish composed for guitar because you just love their music so much? Well, if Chopin had composed for guitar, I don't know if he would have wanted to, but <laughs> I, I just love Chopin. And if, if you've never heard the Arthur Rubinstein recordings, uh, the Nocturnes and the, the you know, there's so much that he recorded of Chopin. It's just meltingly gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And a couple things work sort of on the guitar, but if Chopin had really come to know the instrument and wanted to, to write for it, that would have been a great, great gift. Wow, okay, cool. Uh, going back to your albums, and you've done so many albums, and now in this time, so many people are uh, putting out albums and also just live performances through Facebook and other social media. Um, this might be a tough question, but why should people, you know, go for it and listen to your albums? What's so important about the new albums and what means a lot to you from those two albums? Well, the two albums that just came out uh -huh. on the end, the end of May, May 22nd, Affinity and Strings for Peace are both world premiere albums. They, they include music that has never been heard before. And both of them are comprised of, of works that were specially composed for me. So that I think should attract people's interest because it means something new and different that is part of our world and that is expressive of it. The fact that the Strings for Peace is a unique collaboration with guitar and sarod and tabla is even more special because it's a different genre, one that I hadn't yet explored, but I had come to appreciate ever since listening to Indian, North Indian classical music back in my college days. And certainly for the last number of years in my friendship with Amjad Ali Khan, I, it's, I'm just so gratified that this worked. And what's funny about that after our tour in February 2019, they said, would you like to come back to India and record this in September? And I said, no, I don't want to come back in the middle of monsoon season and be washed away. Why don't we instead record it when you are here in April of 2019? Do you have an extra day that you could devote to this? And they did. They had two days. So I had to, to scramble within three weeks of that time period, find a studio in New York. Believe me, most of them were booked up, but I found a terrific one, Reservoir, which has a long legacy in the pop world, and <clears throat> just decided to go for it. And we went in because we'd performed the music, we just went in and we actually recorded it in a day and a half. And I've never done that before. And we also didn't have a producer. So I acted as a producer and Amjad and his sons acted as the producers because they knew the music better than anybody I could have brought in from the outside. So we chose our takes. We did a preliminary edit then. And then Ayan brought the music to a brilliant mixer and master in India, uh, Sai Shravanam with Resound India. And he just did his magic on this and he was a tablet player himself so he knew the music and the style and the forms inside out so if there was an extra beat in the tabla he knew it and he couldn't have been a better person to do it and people have audio files and people at npr they're flipping over this album because it it is really something special and different so i hope your listeners 
well, go to it. It's already been number two on the world music charts on Amazon, and this is just beginning. I mean, it just, just came out. The other album is really a dream come true because Chris Brubeck and I had talked about collaborating about a dozen years ago, and I had fallen in love with a piece that he had written for three violin players, Irish fiddle, classical, and jazz. And it never happened because I didn't find the funding at that time. So when I was doing a concert out west with orchestra and I was approached by someone who said, I, I loved your performance, I'd like to commission a concerto for you. That, you know, how often does that happen? Never. Um, I just have to go find the money somewhere. But in this case, it was being offered and I had to come up with the composer. And by then, I'd really worked with so many people that, that have already been on my dream list. Mm -hmm. But Elizabeth Scholz from the Maryland Symphony said, well, what about Chris Brubeck? And I said, ah, yes, what a great idea. We'd wanted to do this many years ago and now we have the opportunity. And Chris was thrilled with the idea. It's called Affinity because we both share an affinity for different styles of music. He comes from the jazz world and the classical world, but mostly he's a jazz player. And his father, Dave Brubeck, we're celebrating Dave Brubeck's centenary, the 100th anniversary of his birth this fall. Uh, Dave, of course, is a legend in the musical world. And Chris knew about my collaborations with different styles of music. So he wanted to incorporate some of that in this piece. So you have everything from that jazz ele element to Middle Eastern themes, and what was curious about this experience is something that has never happened to me before working with a composer. He actually, in the process of starting to write, would call me up and say, can I come over and play what I have for you so far and see what you think? And I said, oh, well, this is, this is fascinating. He said, well, any critiques? I said, you want me to critique what you're writing? He said, yes. Now, it would take a composer with enormous self-confidence, inner strength, and trust to be able to open themselves up in a vulnerable way like that. So I took him up on the offer, and I would suggest little things here and there and different ways of approaching things. And when it came time to listening to the slow part, I realized that it just didn't grab me. So how do you tell that to a composer? So I said to him, I said, you know, it's interesting. Your, your father, Dave Brubeck, died this year and your mother had passed away recently. I thought, might there not be something about them that you would want to pay tribute to in this guitar concerto? Because I know that, that you've been grieving and this, this was really a part of your life. And he said, ah, oh, I'm so glad you asked. He said, I thought you only wanted my own music. And I said, no, I want you to write what's in your heart. And if that includes something of your father's say in this slow section, I would be thrilled. So he sent both me and the conductor several ballads to listen to and we both went this one and it was called Autumn. And it had a, a, occurred to Chris because it was autumn while he was writing the piece. He was looking out the window, he saw the, the leaves falling and he remembered the time that he and his father had played this music that his father had composed. So he ended up throwing out the entire slow section that I had heard before and replacing it with a beautiful arrangement of his father's piece, Autumn, wow. that forms the heart and soul of the piece. So speaking out and, and sharing your heart with someone who is willing to trust you on that can change wow. something in a very big way. That's, that's amazing. That's a beautiful story. And I was going to, you said so many things that if musicians are listening closely, especially young musicians, they'll take so much away from it uh, and, and be inspired by it. But is there one last thing and advice to young musicians who are maybe struggling with careers or trying to figure things out? What advice would you give them based on everything that you've done in your life? Well, with my own students, I really encourage them to do something no one else has done before. And I can't tell them what that is. They have to figure that out themselves. In some cases, it might be making arrangements of music that is unique to their own country, whether it's Korea or Persia or um, French or Spanish, what, whatever it might be, something that's different and unusual. I have an Australian, uh, several Australian students who are playing music by Australian composers that 
we haven't heard over here. And it's marvelous to, to hear them doing that. And I also matched up one of my students uh, who was doing his Carnegie Hall debut. He's Chinese and matched him up with Wang Ji, Chinese composer who I'd come to really admire and respect. And I thought they would hit it off and that she could write him a guitar piece that he'd be able to premiere in his his Carnegie Hall concert and his tour as a winner of the Guitar Foundation of America uh, competition. And that happened and he fell in love with the piece and, and they just have loved working together. So I can, I can be an influence and an instigator in the end, they have to run with the ball and they have to come up with the ideas. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Is there anything you want to add before we end? I, I'm just, I can't wait to hear you in concert and okay. for all of us to come back once again. I know that this is a, a traumatic time mm -hmm. for so many millions of people and we've all lost people that we've cared about. And we're trying to, to make the best of a situation by still sharing music, which I hope can offer comfort to people and wait out this time until we can once again be in person and on the stage together. And I, I'm gratified that the David Lynch Foundation, which I mentioned earlier, has created another program called Heal the Healers Now, where they are bringing TM and teaching it for free to people in emergency rooms who are doctors and who are surgeons and who are caretakers because the stress that they're under is just unbelievable. And I know it's, it's saving lives. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharon Nisbin with, was my guest today. Thank you so much and have a beautiful day. Thank you so much, Tikran. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.